This year's Congress was is being hosted by the University of California, Davis. I think the next slide shows. Yes, here's the agenda for the day. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are virtually gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Kachil Dihi, Band of Wintun Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Kletzel Dihi Wintun Nation, and Yochu Dihi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been shared and protected as elders have instructed the young through generation. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Jen. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Susan, for starting us out that way. I, I had requested that we do something special to start this conference today. Uh, and the reason is that we've been through quite a year. Um, and I think we've all realized that we have so many things to appreciate that we don't normally verbalize, uh, especially in situations like a Congress. So I thought it would be good for us to acknowledge um, and appreciate um, all of the things that we have and we're grateful for. So thank you, Susan. Um, I want to welcome everyone here today. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to see faculty, students, staff, um, advisory council members, supporters, stakeholders, so many of you who are able to attend. Um, I was, I'm going to go off of script um, because we just received some very sad news, at least uh, for many of us, and that is that our wonderful colleague, wonderful friend, um, Marty Wax, passed away last night. Uh, Marty, um, I'm sure, has touched just about everyone who's sitting in this Congress today, um, either as a teacher or if reading his readings as a mentor. I could I could go on and on. Um, and I'm kind of still in shock, so I'm not doing a very good job here. Uh, but I really wanted um, to acknowledge that um, we lost him um, very, very um, sort of suddenly. And I'm hoping that we can all uh, just take one minute to observe silence um, in his honor. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm sure that um, we will soon figure out how to celebrate um, his wonderful life and accomplishments. So now I will go back on script. Um, Court, next slide. So I want to welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, our third PSR Congress, should have been the fourth. Uh, but um, COVID got us, and in 2020, uh, we canceled the entire Congress due to COVID. We were supposed to go to Hawaii. Um, University of Hawaii, our partner, had organized a wonderful event, and uh, we really we had to cancel at the last moment. Um, and so, again, I want to thank our University of Hawaii colleagues for all of their hard work to create what I'm sure would have been a really great meeting. Um, this year, as the pandemic raged on, we decided that we would need to go virtual. Um, and UC Davis uh, graciously um, volunteered to host uh, this conference. Um, optimists that we are, we are uh, absolutely sure and we're planning uh, for 2022 uh, PSR Congress to be in Hawaii. So 
uh, we're hopeful that by a year from now, we'll all be back on airplanes. Today, I want to begin by thanking the entire UC Davis team for organizing the conference and for training all of us on Remo. Remo. Uh, hopefully, we've all had the connection and other, we've already put all the problems behind us and we will have a smooth technology experience uh, today. The purpose of the Congress is to share our accomplishments over the past year with all of you. Uh, as you know, we're an amazing partnership of eight universities and colleges with expertise in just about every area of transportation. And this is not just in research, but it's in education and training, as well as tech transfer and policy guidance. You're going to hear today about our work from faculty and students, and we look forward to everybody's participation in our panel sessions that will be led by members of the PSR Advisory Council. We are particularly honored to have Robert Hampshire here with us today, our new Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology Policy. Um, at the Department of Transportation, I should say at the Office of the Secretary of Transportation, uh, as our keynote speaker today. So we're very, very grateful that he was able to take time out of his really busy schedule uh, to uh, come to this Congress. Before we begin the main program, I thought I should share just a little bit um, of a brief overview of our, of our PSR work. Uh, and what you see here on the screen um, is the first slide, which is on research. Um, and uh, to date, we have um, 85 different projects, uh, 29 of which have been finished. Uh, and uh, they are spread across our partners, as you see there um, in, the, in the pie chart. Um, from our last semi-annual report, I was, I'm able to tell you that we have managed to produce 13 peer-reviewed publications, 23 other publications, and 12 conference papers. So you can see that uh, we have a really active research program. Um, we are, as these centers always uh, kind of get a, a slow start in the first year, the money comes in long after the awards are announced and things like that. Uh, so you'll be seeing us uh, completing more and more projects. The, the completion rate is accelerating and will continue to accelerate as we go forward. Uh, next screen, next slide. Um, just to uh, remind everyone that, as I said, we are experts not just in research, but in education and training. Um, and I just have two pictures here to give you an idea of some of the interesting training that is part of the PSR. Uh, the first is at Pima College, uh, which offers uh, commercial driver's license training for uh, automated and semi-automated trucks. Uh, and PSR funding has made it possible to put much of the truck driving uh, training online. At Cal State Long Beach, um, Long Beach uh, has developed many different uh, programs per, for what I would call professional development. And among them is the Caltrans Freight Academy. Um, and the Freight Academy is aimed at training uh, freight and uh, training professionals who are in positions that related to freight and supply chains. Um, to give them some basic education and background uh, on that type of training. Next slide. We also are very busy uh, on the engagement side. Um, and this very complicated slide just kind of says that we do all kinds of engagement. First of all, technical assistance for industries and agencies. Secondly, information and advisement for policymakers. Uh, and secondly, uh, and thirdly, um, partnerships and discussion forums that include academia, industry, uh, and the public sector as well. Um, you will, I think, hear a little bit about, or you should have seen our um, 
our online journal, Transfers, uh, which uh, is aimed at getting the word out to the general public on some of the uh, research that we do. Um, I believe there's maybe one more slide. No, okay. Um, I'll end then with a pitch before I get to Robert Hampshire, and the pitch is that um, uh, we will have our International Urban Freight Conference in October, to which you will all, of course, be uh, invited. Okay, so uh, we're almost precisely uh, on time, which is always good. Uh, and my next job is a wonderful job, uh, and that job is to introduce uh, Robert Hampshire, our, our keynote speaker. Um, Robert Hampshire serves as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology Policy, as I said before, one of the longer titles. Um, but he was previously an Associate Professor at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. Um, he was also a research associate professor in both the um, University of Minnesota Transportation Research um, Institute and the Michigan, I'm sorry, University of Michigan, and U Michigan Institute for Data Science. Um, I should mention that um, we have some distant ties with Robert Hampshire because uh, his uh, PhD is in industrial and systems engineering. Uh, and one of our faculty knew him um, as a young student. Um, his unique blend of engineering systems research with public policy has made him a leader in not only transportation research, but also on the disparate impact of policy decisions in transportation systems. This has led to important strides in our understanding of transportation equity, his research applies operations research, data science, and systems approaches to analyze novel transportation systems, such as smart parking, connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, ride hailing, bike sharing, car sharing, as well as pedestrian and bicyclist safety. Uh, I'm gonna make a safe bet here and say that he's probably not gonna have a lot of time for all of this research in his new job. Um, his research focuses on environmental impacts, equity, and access to opportunities. Uh, his work has been widely cited and covered by major press outlets. He has worked extensively with both public and private sector partners um, worldwide. He has also been a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon and a visiting professor at MIT. He received his PhD in operations research and financial engineering from Princeton University. So, uh, Robert, do we have you present? Yes, I, I am present. Can you hear me? Welcome, welcome to you. virtual California. We're happy to Thank have you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Giuliano. I wish some of that uh, California sun, I'm sure, was here with me in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but it's not. But I'm, I'm <laughs> nonetheless, I'm thrilled to be here in virtual California with everyone, so thank you. Uh, I wanna thank uh, UC Davis, uh, the organizers and all the member schools and faculty and students from the Pacific Southwest Regional UTC. It's been a great honor and pleasure on my part to be uh, my office leading uh, the UTC program, and it's just really humbling and exciting to be here with you all uh, today. Uh, many of the folks on the line today are folks that I look up to and admire and have for years uh, in transportation research and sus particularly sustainability and technology. So it's just a, a true honor. So thank you. So I'm the acting, I have a long title, but I'm the acting assistant secretary for research and technology. So my office coordinates all the research across DLT, across all modes, aviation, maritime, uh, pipelines, transit, uh, and highways. And, you know, today, you know, today's event, you know, you guys are going to focus on four 
essential themes, you know, technology to address transportation's problems and in ways to improve mobility, ways in which improve mo improving mobility supports and serves vulnerable populations, improving resilience and protecting the environment, something that for, uh, this UTC and, and member universities are, are world-class uh, for many years about, and also managing mobility in high growth areas. So I know later today, you know, you'll have a panel discussions on all these various themes. So I just kind of want to speak to you about each of these themes with a focus on the second and third theme, particularly uh, vulnerable populations and resilience uh, in the context, particularly of the national and the administration's priorities and how your work can and does contribute to those priorities. So in my now new role at DLT, I'm charged with making sure that the research uh, supports, research and technology supports the goals of, of this administration. And those key priorities are one, first, getting past COVID. So the interactions between transportation system and COVID, particularly in research and technology, you know, making sure what can we do to help manage health first off, uh, but also vaccine distri distribution, strategic planning, economic recovery, any ways in which your research can support COVID response is something that is very much appreciated and thank you for your leadership. Second, you've heard a lot about building back better. And so that, you know, is the economic plan to make sure that we, you know, have improved the foundation of public investment in improving the social contract, physical infrastructure, and innovation. So I always say part of the building back better, the better part is that it provide, we want to provide more opportunities for more people. And that leads into the third priority for this administration, which is tackling racial inequity. And so we are being very explicit, very proactive about advancing racial equity in America, closing the wealth gap, expanding access to affordable housing, and ultimately transportation as a connector, connecting to opportunity. And last goal, but not certainly not least, is a foundational goal, which is living up to our climate responsibilities. We're back at leading the world in climate mitigation. And it's one of the goals of this administration and the Department of Transportation to take that lead seriously and be proactive in ways in which we're innovating, deploying, and ultimately getting to net zero carbon from the transportation system by 2050. So these are the goals for this administration that I was so excited to join. And these are the same goals by which I'm leading the research and technology office. And with the support of work that you all are doing, we can lead and make move the needle on these issues. As you know, this administration just in introduced the infrastructure bill plan, otherwise known as the American Jobs Plan you know, which includes a large focus, of course, on infrastructure. You know, some of the key takeaways are, you know, a large part of the American Jobs Plan is aimed at fixing highways, rebuilding bridges, and upgrading ports, airports, transit systems. That's like the physical infrastructure. You know, this is a once-in-a-lifetime investment in, in America to not only meet our current infrastructure needs, but make sure that we're rebuilding in a way that also invest in people, but also invest in your research and development. So you can expect for this American Jobs Plan or Infrastructure Plan to have research dollars to make sure that we have the right knowledge and evidence base as we're making these decisions. Uh, you know, unlike you know investments of the past in, in highway infrastructure, you know we're not going to leave behind communities that have been systematically excluded for generations. We're going to be proactive about including and even uh, retrospective justice for communities of color and, and rural communities. The American Jobs Plan also seeks to reduce the impacts of climate 
change through more sustainable and innovative materials and strengthening resiliency to natural disasters. You know, and also I'll just say the last thing I'll say on this is that, you know, our investments will allow us to take on this climate crisis in a way that we can move into a clean energy economy. And so those are some of the contours of, of this infrastructure plan that it, or that we're rolling out and it has is fa founded and has a foundation in research and technology and the work you're doing in your T UTCs and the work that you'll continue to do. So later today in the panels, one of them is technology to address transportation problems and, and to improve mobility. You know, we know, and I've been a professor, you know, uh, an engineer and operations researcher, you know, I think innovation is a key, is part of the portfolio of, of building back better, is a key priority. Um, and it certainly means we should look to using tools and ideas at our disposal and working towards mobility solutions. At a high level, all this could and should mean technology components. Uh, but I want to make sure it means opportunity should be look to integrate technical solutions and digital infrastructure. But it also means looking at solutions that are targeted and coordinated and as well as sustainable. So we're not technology for technology's sake, but for technology to an end related to the priorities that I outlined, be it equity, be that sustainability and leading on climate. You know, at the larger scale, this American jobs plan, the infrastructure, our infrastructure plan is looking to implement and integrate critical technologies to upgrading infrastructure, but in conjunction with a large scale revamping. You know, so this is an opportunity to really take a new look at the way we do infrastructure, both physical infrastructure and social infrastructure. You know, these solutions especially need to be community-based and they include, here community means, you know, your neighborhoods, your local community, but also together with partners at the state and local level. There's a acknowledgement and finally learned after many years that these big infrastructure plans and, and, re, and re, particularly research and technology need to be community driven, they need to be a voice at the table for you know people's you know, families. I think about my grandmother or social organizations and local governments that have a role in understanding the technology and infrastructure that's being put in place. You know, when we're looking at these technology-based solutions, you know, at the regional and research level, we want to consider, you know, for example, how to best implement them and where, you know, who has a role in that. Uh, you know, think, you know, last mile solutions, think, you know, freight resiliency, like how do, what does that look like and who's helping to define those? Um, and also in implementation, I think oftentimes, you know, for me, to put a research hat on, sometimes we think about we're coming up with this nice, cool model and we have this, but like when it comes to implementation, we know that there's a workforce and your UTC has been doing a terrific job when you think about workforce, who are the workforce that are implementing these ideas? And I think research could be done on that in ways in which the best practices and, and what are the, the, the ways that we want to, to think about equity and implementation. Another one of the panel themes is about improving mobility for vulnerable populations. That's, you know, that dovetails with what I was just talking about. You know, the focus in transportation planning often, often it's getting better, of course, ignores the social equity concerns related to resource deficits faced by low and moderate income and minority populations. You know, areas that, that we as transportation researchers can look at, look to to implement these solutions, particularly you know, as we saw in COVID, uh, you know, there's a need to really address the most vulnerable communities. This has been, of course, accelerated and exposed uh, during COVID, as you guys all know. You know, as I mentioned earlier, particularly the infrastructure plan that, you know, we're releasing, you know, there's, you know, an effort to ensure that we don't leave these communities behind, but, you know, we systematically include them in a proactive way. And I would say that the, the secretary has been masterful, I believe, at how, you know, particularly the way he is attuned to 
and is putting the community-based approaches on the table in a proactive way. You know, within, particularly within certain communities, transportation, as you know, is an opportunity for advancement. You know, be it, you know, getting to employment, social services, uh, but also when we think about social movements, I always think about transportation as a link or opportunity to, for social movements. And when you think about you know, for example, the civil rights movement, oftentimes that was, a, that was based in transportation. The communities, you know, Mont Mont Montgomery bus boycott, right? What is that? That's about buses. The uh, Pullman porters, A. Philip Randolph, he was, you know, that was about trains. Same thing with um, Plessy versus Ferguson was a, a case, Supreme Court case is about access to railroads. And so transportation has always also been key to social movements. And we see that even now with, unfortunately, you know, today, you know, more, um, you know, tragic news and in, in from yesterday in Minnesota, you know, an individual being killed in his car, right? Black Lives, Lives Matter movement happening on highways, right? So these, that's one aspect of mobility and transportation I want us to also think about as a sort of a, a for social movements. And, you know, the fact that many protests happen on roads and you have to ask the question why, because the transportation system is so critical to the way in which our economy and lives work. You know, so I, I wanted this, I wanted to bring that out when we think about that panel about improving mobility for vulnerable populations. It's not just the movement of those vulnerable populations themselves, but what it represents is a broader set of values. And finally, one of the another theme for the panel later today is going to be about improving resiliency and protecting the environment. You know, and this is something that you all have led on for years. And I just commend you on that. I, I remember, you know, all just from my days from <laughs> way back as, you know, undergrad or grad student, you know, folks on this call and others have led the way to think about transportation and, and resiliency and, and climate particularly. Um, and you guys, you guys live it there, you know? And so we know that, you know, in the last 10 years, we've seen an unprecedented number of natural disasters. I'm sure that, you know, unfortunately you guys might've lived through some of them, you know, and, and so particularly compounding stressors, not just one disaster, but multiple on top of each other, you know, and this is something this administration we're taking very seriously as you know our administration we're uh yeah you know my office specifically has restarted our climate change innovation center that's been dormant for the last four years so i mean we're restarting the work on climate we've lost four years there's i'm not sure how many gigatons of extra carbon that equivalents that are in the air that we can't get back. Uh, so we're behind, we're behind the eight ball on this. And so we're, this administration is very serious about refocusing on climate. And we're looking to build and utilize, you know, the variety of transportation modes that not only reflect, you know, transportation labor market patterns and needs of our communities, but in ways in which it cuts down our carbon footprint to reach that net zero by 2050. You know, of course, you know, this portfolio of, of research at DOT and that's embodied as well by UTCs is a great source of, of, of knowledge, of evidence base that we're gonna rely on you you all to help and push us. I know, you know, particularly UC Davis and the folks in this UTC get in front of Congress and, and, and make that case. You know, this of course means, you know, sustainable fuels. This is of course, you know, behavioral changes. Uh, at Department of Transportation, we have FEMSA, that's the uh, pipelines uh, agency. So we, you know, sustainable pipelines and networks that are part of that story. You know, there have been, you know, a number of projects that have come out of this, your, your UTC on climate mitigation over the years, land use, planning, reduction of carbon emissions and sustainability. So, you know, we keep looking at ways to try to integrate that research into workable solutions. That's sort of also where we are now. The, you know, the evidence is there for many solutions, but now, you know, getting those, it's like translational research, like we know what works, now getting it into practice. 
And so there's a gap there that I think you all have to contribute and continue to contribute about that translational work. If you look in the American Jobs Plan, there's you know, funding and items there, particularly about climate innovation and that translational work to get things into practice. You know, again, this UTC and, and others in, in your region, you know, have done a lot of work in this area. And I want to commend you for that. I want to encourage you. Uh, this administration wants to encourage you. The secretary wants to encourage you to continue and keep engaging and leading. Um, as researchers, and I'm, you know, I want to continue to keep listening. You know, I'm going to lead this community and, and DOT, but also listen um, to you all. But I also want to encourage you all to li continue to listen as well to the community, to local and you know state partners that you have. Um, in ways in which that, you know, we treat them as the ultimate customer in the sense that we want to listen and understand the needs, particularly as it relates to climate and resiliency. And let me just uh, get wrap up a bit here. And so, you know, one thing I know for sure is that, you know, this UTC, you know, takes, has taken a holistic kind of systems approach to solving problems, particularly around climate, resiliency, mobility. You know, I, again, I want to encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, DLT, our doors are open again to, to work on climate and to lead on climate. And I continue to encourage you to work with us on that. You know, you know, I also would think about ways that you can push us as a federal government to help you in ways in which we can help you continue the great work you've been doing to help us build a better transportation system. You know, so I realize I covered a lot of ground in, in this short amount of time, but I'm looking forward to, you know, continue to see what comes out of the panel discussions of this Congress. And know, I know that there's large challenges to tackle, but I extend my you know, sincere thank you for the work that you've done over the years and you continue to do. And I urge you to keep working and I look forward uh, to working with you in the future. And it, again, it's just a, such a great honor uh, to be here and having had the opportunity to address you all. And uh, you know where to find me. We're here at uh, DOT. Um, I'm leading the Office of Research and Technology, so please reach out. I would love to hear about all the great uh, work and findings that you guys have, but also suggestions and areas that we should, my office and DOT, Department of Transportation as a whole, should be really uh, honing in on. So I really look forward to your feedback. Uh, so with that, I want to say thank you. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Professor Giuliano. Thank you so much, Robert. And uh, virtual applause. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for um, um, coming. And thank you so much for, for um, reading and studying our, our center. Um, we have a couple minutes. For Q and A, I see one question um, in the question box. I can read it, and <clears throat> it's it's from uh, from Mike. Uh, how can UTC's partner with OSTR to spread the word about our research and make sure the research gets into the hands of those who can use it? Thank you. Yeah, that this is. Uh, thank you for offering that. That is an important aspect of some of the initiatives that, that I want to lead and together with uh, Caesar Singh, who's the head of the UTC program, to make sure that the findings and results from all the UTCs, there's 41 of them, that they're actually reaching, you know, within DLT policymakers, but also a broader um, set of, of, of eyes and ears. And so that's, that's something that we're working and, and try to think about revamping what that looks like, be it through webinars or, or white papers. You guys do a fantastic job with transfers. Of course, I've had papers, pub something published in transfers and in the previous carnation of it uh, that Don, you know, uh, Shoup ran. And so I think- and Don um, Shoup is still there. <laughs> he's still he's still running. Oh, he's, what's he's called one access. Our, he's one of our editors. He's 
Okay. So it was called Access, and now it's Transfers. I know those <clears> are different <throat> names, but all of them are fantastic outlets like that. Uh, but we're not quite 100 days in yet, but this is one of the things that unlocking some of the knowledge uh, and findings from the UTCs to really uh, you start to influence the, the policy discussions more is something that's uh, on my on my plate. So thank you. We'll stay tuned. Well, yeah, we're we're happy to uh, we're happy to provide whatever we can, and Mike in particular is very good at that at that um, at being able to put our uh, very academic work into language and you know pieces of pieces of text that are no bigger than the screen um, to to get it out there. Uh, he's he's marvelous at, at doing that. And I know too, within the state of California, you guys, there's other mechanisms for those in California to inter engage at the state level and the state uh, uh, state level government. The, all that is is very important and ab admirable. So, yeah, we're very fortunate in California. Uh, we're also making headway and with our name, you know, our partners in Arizona and our partners in um, Hawaii. Hawaii, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you you know, there's a lot of that that goes on <clears throat> in each of the states uh, in this region. Are there other questions? I don't see any more um, in the Q&A box. Okay. Natalie, are you getting any questions? More. Doesn't look like it. There's one more in the the. Um, Where? Jen, if you'd like me to jump in, so um, so. Ah, that here we go. I see it. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking to the next generation and those of us who recruit, mm. support, educate, and train them, what do you see is for their future, and how do you recommend that? we prepare them for it <laughs> yeah well um this is you know part of the mission for workforce uh, development for our utcs um i always think that i'm sort of a, a science and math guy at heart you know i, I want to be inspired initially by just creativity and the discovery of, of new things i think depending on what age of a kid, but maybe it's, it's ageless to sort of spark that that pure kind of creativity and art, you know, creative spark is, is important. But I also think that, like I mentioned, that transportation is something that is critical to the well-being of our country and, and the world, how we live. And I think that message that working in particularly, you know, transportation-related fields, you have the possibility to impact many aspects of life, the lived experience, be it health and human services, be that housing, be that drug rehab, be that um, drug reentry programs. We were talking to the Department of Justice. Do you realize most local courts are paid for by 50% by traffic? So the transportation system basically subsidizes courts. And so I think as that bridge, you know, as that transfer point, the transportation system, I think that could resonate, I think, with for people, the workforce, who, you know, particularly those who want to study and, and get into this this space, I think is really important as, a, as an angle. I think that's important to emphasize. OK, I'm looking at my clock and I think we need to move on to our, our next activity. Um, Robert, thank you again so much. It was thank a you. pleasure having you and we hope you can stick around and peek your head in at a few of the panels. Um, as you go about your, no doubt, really busy day. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for having me, and I hope to uh, see you all in person soon. Oh, yes, we all do. <laughs> thank, thank you. you.